praise to Him, the God of life, who formed the mountains by His might. All praise to Him who made the stars that sing His fame in skies afar. All praise to Him who reigns in love, who guides the God. Good morning. It's good to see you. Uh, welcome to uh, this gathering of Redeeming Grace Baptist Church. It's great to be together today, uh, to worship together, to uh, consider truth from God's Word, uh, to be encouraged in that, and to enjoy this fellowship in Jesus. We thank you for being here. If you are new to Redeeming Grace, it's a joy to have you visiting with us today. Hope that you enjoy this time of worship, uh, that you're encouraged in it, that, uh, that we would be uh, able to uh, connect with you maybe in some way. If you're new and looking for a church, uh, we would love to connect with you further. Um, if you're just passing through, we're just thrilled that you're with us. I uh, hope that you enjoy this time uh, as we worship Jesus together today and that we would all be encouraged and edified in the truth. I do have just a few announcements to make note of this morning as we begin our time together. Uh, this is the season that we are uh, prioritizing what we call the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, and so we're asking you to prayerfully consider giving generously towards this special offering. Uh, for those of you who've been here, you know what that is. If you're new to us and you're thinking, well, what is the Lottie Moon Christmas offering? This offering goes towards funding our Southern Baptist missionaries all across the world. And so this fund, 100% uh, of these dollars go straight to supporting salaries, missionary resources, and housing, and training, and mobilization efforts all across the world. And so the reason we're able to have missionaries serving where they serve is largely due in part to this offering. And so I always say, and you, some may not agree, but I think it's true, uh, that this is the second most important offering you can give to beyond the general budget uh, and operations and ministry of this local church. And so I think it's a significant priority that we would give to fund the work of the gospel among the nations. And so we would just encourage you to be prayerful in what the Lord would have you give concerning this opportunity to send out workers into the harvest field among the unreached of the world. And on that same note, a second announcement is that we do have a Guatemala mission trip coming up in May. This has been uh, kind of on pause for the last couple of years due to... Uh, the pandemic, but now it's back, and so we are uh, encouraging you to pray about considering going on this mission trip. It's a short-term trip, uh, literally short, not even a full week, uh, able to get down there and back pretty quick, but this is largely a medical mission trip, uh, so half the team, we need uh, medical personnel that's able to do some kind of medical care, and the other half doesn't need to be, but you can be there to just be a help and uh, to do evangelism and ministry of various kinds. And so uh, if you're interested in that, be praying about that. And then the application deadline for that trip is December the 31st. And so you can access the application via Planning Center, Church Center app. If you have questions uh, about all of that, feel free to ask myself, or you can talk to Christian Utera directly. Christian, raise your hand in the back. He's right back there. And so uh, if you're interested in serving in Guatemala in May, that is coming up soon as far as the application process, so be aware of that. And then uh, save these dates, mark your calendars with these important upcoming dates in our church. As of today, December 11th, 2022, these are accurate, uh, always subject to change. Uh, but December 25th, join us here for Christmas morning 
Uh, 10.30 a.m., just like normal, we'll be having our uh, Christmas Day service right here uh, at KCA. Uh, Lord willing, uh, we will uh, be looking towards possibly having and hopefully having our very first service in the new building on January 1st. Uh, and so that's an exciting opportunity for us. These next several weeks are going to be quite busy uh, with that uh, transition and logistics and getting us moved and all the rest. If you're interested in serving in some way, helping move stuff, we got a lot of stuff to move. And so um, there should be, uh, you could just contact the church office, contact uh, myself or Pastor Jeremy, and we can help get you connected. But if you'll look in your church newsletter, if you receive that uh, on Friday, there's an extensive list of people who are leading up teams and certain efforts to help us get moved and transitioned into the new building. And those are some points of contact you can ask uh, and contact and connect with as well to get us moved over there. And Lord willing, assuming all that goes well, we'll be having our building dedication service during the morning worship hour on Sunday, January the 15th. Uh, and so we're excited about all that, looking forward to it, and know that the Lord will continue to uh, bless as we look forward together. I want to read from Isaiah chapter 9 this morning as we begin our time of worship. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Isaiah wrote, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you've increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. And then you jump down to verse 6, and Isaiah continues and says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your grace that you gladly give us to uh, wake up into a new day to be able to gather here in this place as your people. Lord, would you meet us here by your Holy Spirit today and help us to make much of you because you, Lord, are worthy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and as we come to the table, we don't bring anything to Jesus <clears throat> for his work is finished by his person and work. And let us praise him as we focus on the words and let our hearts be inclined to worship him with our whole heart. Let's worship together. In the bleak midwinter, all creation groans for a world in darkness. Frozen like a stone, light is breaking in a stable for a throne, and he shall. Here within a manger lies the one who made 
beneath the starry skies A baby born for sacrifice and Christ the Messiah and To our hopes and to our fears The Savior of the world of peace The promise of eternal years Christ the Messiah And He shall reign forevermore, forevermore Jesus, Son of God, so full of grace and truth, the Father's saving word, so wonderful are you. The angels long to see, and prophets search to find the glory we have seen revealed. You shine upon the earth. to your own, but who will recognize? Your birth was prophesied, for you were the Messiah, who came and walked upon the earth. Your glory we have seen, the one and only King, and now you're So love, light of the 
I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 through 11. It goes on and says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare, her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cries, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty. It's like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fade when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade, and the word of the Lord will stand forever. Get you up in a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This is the word of the Lord. This time, let's join together and go to the Lord in prayer, acknowledging our need of God, our need for his Holy Spirit in our lives, um, for all the things that we face. Uh, let us come now together as his people in prayer, praising him and seeking his guidance in our life. Will you join me as we pray together? Father, we thank you that in particular this season we can celebrate your advent, your coming to this earth, our Savior, light coming into darkness. Father, we thank you for keeping your promise. Your promises of old as prophesied in Isaiah and other passages have been fulfilled in the person and the work of Jesus, our Savior. Father, we pray that that very truth and even that truth that we sing would bring us encouragement, would bring us hope, in our day-to-day -day living, our day-to-day -day thinking, our day-to-day -day struggles, the things that we face, Lord, would you help us to rest on the fact that your word is true and you are faithful. The grass comes, the grass goes, but your word remains forever. Your words are true. And so, Father, we praise you for who you are. We praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you for the salvation that you have provided us through Jesus Christ. Father, would you help us each and every day, even today as we gather to worship, as we come together with other brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Father, would you help us to be impacted by that truth evermore today? That our sins can be forgiven and we have life eternal through Jesus Christ. Father, for that truth, we praise your name and we give you all thanks and all glory for you have done it. Father, we come to you today lifting up our needs before you, which are many. Lord, we take comfort in the, in the fact that you intricately know us, every single thing about us you know. And so, Father, we pray for your wisdom, your guidance, the strength of your Holy Spirit for obedience in our lives each day. Father, we humbly come asking that you would grant these things in our life as we seek after you, that you would feed us from your word, that you would encourage us through other brothers and sisters in Christ. Even by gathering today, Lord, to worship you, we pray that you would strengthen us, strengthen us as we gather together to get encouragement, knowing that we don't walk in this life alone but you have given us friends and we praise you for that father we lift up our needs before you we pray today for uh, curtis and susan briggs nephew michael as he was found unresponsive just a couple of days ago father we pray that you would bring healing unto his body and that you would grant peace to the family Lord, we lift up the Spinnaweber family to you at Evelyn's diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, and we pray, Father, that you would just grant them their every need and the new challenges that they face, that they would turn to you. And I pray, Father, that you would strengthen them, that you would comfort them, give them what they need, we pray. Pray for Brother Larry as he um, continues to heal from his recent surgery on his mouth. I pray that you just bring him to uh, full healing from that. Thank you for the progression he's been able to make, and we lift this family up before you, just continuing to ask your hand to be upon them. Father, you know our many needs, even the things that are on our minds right now as we pray. And so, Lord, would you do your work in each of those areas of our life? that you would help us to be faithful to you. Father, we thank you for the church and the various ministries and, and the things that go on here. Father, we thank you for those that are seen, for those that are unseen. We praise you for your work and your spirit that is moving. We lift up in particular tomorrow our Good News Club as they're meeting at Carver Elementary with a Christmas party, and we pray, Father, that that would be um, successful. We pray that uh, these children would continue to be pointed to Jesus, and we pray, Father, that you would bring faith, pray that you would bring salvation to them, strengthen the hands of the workers. We thank you for their faithfulness and serving each week there, and we pray um, at this, this concluding party, we just pray, Father, um, that you would bring connection there and that there would be encouragement in Christ. Thank you for this opportunity and season to give towards international missions as we keep that on the forefront of our minds. And as this has been our week of prayer, we pray today uh, for your redemption through discipleship. We thank you for being able to read about the work that you have been doing in South Asia in our prayer guide. And we lift up the families that are mentioned there, the new converts to Christ that we know of in these unreached people groups. We pray, Father, for families to be reached as those come to Christ, that they would be able to reach others for Christ. We pray for these believers in South Asia who are working and sharing the good news of the gospel, and as they meet and the families gather regularly and to hear your word, we pray, Father, that your work would be done there and that your church would be built. Father, we thank you that you are the God of all nations. Father, we thank you this day that your word, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ has come to our ears, that we have been able to hear it. May we be faithful to tell others about it. As we continue on in our service of worship, Lord, would you guide our hearts as we sing of these great truths, that you would be magnified and 
glorified in this place, that we would be encouraged as we praise your name, and Lord, we pray for your word as it is preached, that it would give forth life. It's in the name of Christ we ask it. Amen. Let's stand together and continue in our worship with joy towards the Lord. serpent's head Adam's likeness now we face stamp thine image in its place second Adam from above reinstate us in thy love hark the herald angels sing glory to
morning. It's good to see you here. If you will take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John chapter 1. In our pre-meeting, pre-worship meeting, the team, we were having a robust discussion over the word hark. What does the word hark mean? And Charlotte googled it right up for us and let us know that it basically means kind of a summons to listen, an announcement. So I told them I was going to hearken you to listen to God's word today. So hark, let's open God's word together to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, we continue to work our way through this series through the first 18 verses of John's gospel over this Christmas Advent season. And we find ourselves today looking at verses 4 through 9, 4 through 9. I'm going to go back and read from verse 1 uh, and just to kind of keep us in the flow of the, the passage. Uh, we looked at the first three verses last week, but I want to go back and read beginning in verse 1 down through verse 9. These are the words that John wrote inspired by the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from John whose name was John, or sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this chapter in your word. Lord, we thank you for these words that you gave John to pen and to write concerning Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, the promised Messiah. So Lord, as we consider more this morning about who he is and what he came to do, Lord, would you give us not only understanding, but Father, would you move our hearts to embrace him in faith and to live underneath his lordship all our days. Lord, we thank you that you've given us life and that you have shown light into the world, a world of darkness, and that we can have hope. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, light, when you think about light, It is really, in one way, the source of life on the planet. Without light, life would cease to exist as we know it. And so one way we could put that is that life is dependent upon light. Think about that. Light sustains life 
in various ways. Light awakens nature. It generates food for plants. It's critical to good health and so forth. Just think about how we respond when the lights go out unexpectedly, right? We scramble for any source of light we can find. And if our phones are not charged, we're desperate. Or if there's the probability of the power going off due to a snowstorm or something of the like, we are making sure that we have some kind of backup plan for light. Like we depend on it, don't we? Our life is dependent on light in many, many ways. And while we can say this regarding our physical world, these two themes of life and light are significant themes and words that the Bible uses to help us understand spiritual realities and blessings that God has given us in his son. These two themes of life and light are found throughout John's writings. We find it certainly right here in our text today in verse four and following. In him was life and the life was the light of men. These two themes we find again throughout this, this, this idea, this theme of life begins and ends the book of John. John 1, 4, we see it, in him was life. In John 20, verses 30 through 31, John says there, these were written, talking about the words of the gospel. The gospel of John was written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So this theme of life is, wed, is, is just throughout this, this gospel, but also the theme of light. Twice, at least, Jesus uses this reference to light to refer to himself. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In John 12, verse 46, he says, I have come into the world as light. And so as John begins this gospel, he begins to develop these two themes, these dependent themes, really, of light and life. And he begins to unpack them all throughout his gospel. We're going to take a, a look this morning together at these two themes of life and light. And really, I want to state these two themes in the following propositions as John develops them. He begins to develop them here and he, he unpacks them throughout. But these are the true main points that, that John's going to help us see here in the text this morning are these two points, and these are the two points of the sermon. Jesus is the source of all life, point number one. Point number two, Jesus is the true light. He is the source of all life, and he is the true light. Those are our two points that we're gonna look at and, 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 and follow this morning in this passage and some other observations along the way to help us understand them further. Point number one, Jesus is the source of all life. In verse four, John says very simply, in him, in him, who? who who's him? Well, he's talking about the word. That's verses one through three, the word of God. The, the word, verse 14, became flesh. We know this is a reference to Jesus. Okay, so in him, in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. So right there, we see him wedding these two terms together. And in verse 3, John had said the divine word, Jesus, is the creator, creator, the giver of life. Right? Remember that in verse 3? All things were made through him. He is the creator. As such, this description in verse 4, in him was life, is a natural follow-on to what's already been stated in verse 3 regarding his creative activity. But as John continues to unpack this theme throughout his gospel, we need to see really the fullness of what is meant when he references Jesus here and, and he says of him, in him was life. We need to consider several kinds of life that Jesus is the source of. Well, already stated, first, he's the source of physical life. From verse 3, which is 
pointing us back to the very beginning and in the beginning. We know already that the Son of God was the active agent of creation. And as such, our physical lives find its source in Jesus. Physical life. The significance of Adam being created is seen in contrast to Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. Paul picks up on this. And he says, thus it was written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. Jesus, the Bible teaches us, is the life-giver. The eternal son was the one actively present in creation, giving life. And therefore, all of our lives are a testimony to the creative work that the eternal son of God one through whom God created the world, we find that source. He is the source of physical life. He's the creator. Not only that, he is the source of spiritual life. John establishes this reality, that Jesus is responsible not only for creation, including our own lives, but he expands on that theme into the spiritual realm. And he really begins to lay the groundwork for his emphasis here on the spiritual component, the spiritual aspect of spiritual life that Jesus gives. But if we're going to understand that, we need to understand why spiritual life is even a need to begin with. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul tells us why we need spiritual life. There Paul says, and you, verse 1, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There this indictment on humanity is, is stated clearly that we are all under the, the judgment and the wrath of God and that we are dead, spiritually dead, in our trespasses and sins. Because we are spiritually dead, we need to be made spiritually alive, right? That's the natural conclusion. That's certainly what the Bible teaches. And so our spiritual condition before becoming a Christian is one that is dead. We're dead. We enter this world spiritually dead, unwilling and unable to make ourselves spiritually alive, right? Dead people can't make themselves alive. They need something to happen. If that's some miracle take place, if that's going to happen. And that's exactly why Jesus came. That's exactly why we celebrate Advent, the coming of the Savior into the world, because he comes as the one who created the world, but because of sin, because of our rebellion against our creator, he comes to rescue those who are now spiritually dead to make them alive. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said there, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Friends, Jesus is the giver of life. Yes, physically, but also spiritually. He gives us new life. And the Bible speaks about this life in all kinds of ways. We know that, but back here in Ephesians 2, we see that we're dead in our trespasses and sins, but, but God, verse 4, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we're dead in our trespasses, even when we're dead, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. See, when we think about this idea of spiritual life, he makes alive those who are spiritually dead. The Bible refers to those who receive this life as a new creation. He's creating new life. You think about this idea of creation, that's what Jesus does. He creates. He creates trees, he creates water, mountains, people. But listen, he also creates Christians. Christians do not create themselves. God creates Christians. He creates them by making them alive spiritually, giving us a new birth, making us new creatures in Jesus. He gives spiritual life. But not only that, physically, spiritually, he gives eternal life. 
This perhaps is John's most favored reference to this word life. It's seen all throughout his gospel in numerous places, including the the well-known words of Jesus from John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. The opposite of eternal life is eternal death, judgment. In John chapter 3, verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus is the giver of eternal life. Now listen, when we think about eternal life, it's not simply the prolonging of our earthly life. It's a heavenly life that begins in us at the moment we believe and will carry on into eternity. The life we now live is is a mere blip on the screen compared to what we will enjoy eternally. And the decisions you make in this life impact what your eternal life will look like. And only through Jesus can we have this everlasting life that that he describes. Indeed, in John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is himself referring to himself as the, the life. You want this kind of life? You want to be made alive spiritually? You want eternal life with God forever? It comes through Jesus. And Jesus alone. Jesus is the source of all life. Point number two. Jesus is the true light. Jesus is the true light. Most of our text this morning really focuses in on this idea of, of light. And John makes the connection that the life we have in Christ is a light that shines in darkness. The first recorded words of God, like where he actually speaks deliberately and directly in the, in the scripture where he's quoted, are in Genesis 1 verse 3 when he says, let there be light. And for the first time, light was formed where previously there was a dark and formless void. Light, we know, is the opposite of darkness. The concept of light is one, again, we understand quite well. We understand light does many things. It illustrates, even we, we even use this word to illustrate various kinds of things. And we've already stated that physical life cannot exist apart from light. And now John takes that idea and applies it into the spiritual realm. We know that Jesus claims, and already quoted from John chapter 8, verse 12, to be the light of the world. But what does that mean? It's a nice statement. It sounds good. I'm the light of the world. It sounds powerful. It sounds something. But what does that mean for us? What does that mean for this world? Well, as light and as the light of the world, Jesus does at least three things. First of all, Jesus reveals He reveals. We know that the purpose of light is to remove darkness. This term darkness, see it in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. This term darkness is often a, a word used in the scripture to describe sin, evil, or even the world, that the evil world that exists, the darkness. It's the dark realm kind of held captive by the evil one. And so it's a word that's referencing not just literally where the lights are off and it's dark, but it's a spiritual condition. It's a spiritual reality. The prophet Isaiah spoke of Jesus' coming as light in the darkness. When he said, I read earlier this morning in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, the people walking in darkness, walking in sin, in, in the depth of depravity, have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. This is not saying that Jesus is the first electric co-op that that existed, where he just brought on a power grid and and made lights. No, it's a a spiritual thing he does. It's It's a spiritual reality that he brings about 
as the light, Jesus ultimately came to reveal God to a world that did not know God. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And so Jesus illuminates, he reveals, he makes known the truth about God because, we saw last week, he is God. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. So what that means for us then is that if you want to see and know God, then you must look to Jesus. He reveals the truth of who God is. As light coming into the world, he is pointing us to the truth of who God is. Number two, the second thing as light Jesus does is that he overcomes he overcomes. The Bible presents the darkness as a term for spiritual ignorance. Again, death, sin, evil, all these, all these concepts kind of fold up into this term darkness. And the darkness stands in direct and deliberate opposition against the light. Namely, God himself. In verse 5, John says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Sometimes, well, most of the time, light is temporary, right? Light bulbs eventually fail. Even if you have LEDs, they will eventually, 20 years from now, fail. Electric grids can be compromised. Every day is met by a night. Light, we know, comes and goes. It's on and off. But the kind of light Jesus brings, listen, will never grow dim or burn out. He's like the perpetual LED. He never goes out. Like he's always on. And even though the darkness seeks to advance its cause and overcome the light, in the end all such efforts fail according to verse 5. Look at verse 5. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John is alluding here to the fact that when Jesus came, he would be opposed, and he was, by the darkness. Why? Because the darkness is opposed to light. Now, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 19, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Let me read that again. John 3, verse 19, Jesus says, This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. Him. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. They were captives of the darkness. And so when the light comes, they, they oppose the light. They love their evil deeds. They love the darkness, right? And you know the, the illustration when you're sound asleep and somebody comes and turns the light on, you're ready to fight, right? That's not a good moment. Like, don't do that. It's, it's not pleasant. We're not, uh, that's, that's really a good picture of, of how, how, how evil responds to the light of Jesus. It's opposed. It hates the light. And that's the reality of our own hearts, brothers and sisters, before Jesus we, we stood opposed. And if you're not a follower of Jesus today, that's, that's your condition now. You are in darkness, and, and the light of Christ is something you stand against. And what the Bible is teaching us is that even though the darkness has rejected the light, has gone on full assault against the light, it does not and will not prevail. It doesn't win. But that shouldn't discount the impact of the darkness in this world. We see the impact of darkness, don't we? We feel it. We see it every day. Darkness hates the light. We see it in all kinds of ways in our day and time, even in our own hearts at times. We live in a dark world where you can see and hear and feel the hostility the darkness has towards the light. Even those who supposedly admire Jesus, they're not followers of Jesus, but like he's a good dude kind of thing. Even those who supposedly admire Jesus 
many still refuse to bow in submission to him as king and Lord, and they resent him in the end for imposing a standard upon them that clashes with their own desires. And so from afar, they may admire him, but when they get into the truth of who he is and what he demands, that there's a clash of worldviews that take place. And the darkness then is, 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 is continues to, to oppose the light because the light of Christ shows, it reveals the darkness for what it is. It's what Jesus does. He shows us that our sin, our rebellion, our depravity are all works of darkness and as such will be condemned. John three nineteen. this is the judgment, right? Darkness will be condemned. But the light of Jesus The light as the light, he brings us rescue from the darkness because he has triumphed over the darkness. He is the light of the world. He came to redeem and to rescue and as the one who illuminates the darkness, he brings hope and he reveals the darkness for what it is and he shows the way out. Friend, if you are in your own heart still clinging to the darkness. If you like the darkness, if you are comfortable in the darkness, and you find Jesus repulsive or offensive, or maybe not that strong, just you find him maybe even interesting, but you're just not that interested in him. you're not wanting to step into the light of Christ by faith, then friend, you simply need to know this. You are on the losing side for the darkness cannot overcome the light. You will perish in that darkness and you will be separated from God for all eternity if you persist in that way. Darkness does not win. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. But not only do we see the truth that Jesus overcomes the darkness, we need to see this, and perhaps most importantly, Jesus redeems us from the darkness. In verses six through eight, John, the apostle, the writer of this book, mentions the name of another John, John the Baptist. And we know that John the Baptist was a man sent by God with the special assignment of being the forerunner of the Messiah. Verse six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is not the same John of the book, writer of the book, it's John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. Why? That all might believe through him. And John the Apostle clarifies about John the Baptist. He was not the light. Let's be clear. John the Baptist was not the light, but he pointed to the light. He came to bear witness about the light. And that was John's mission foretold in the Old Testament. John <laughs> Keeler uh, read that this morning. We've got a lot of Johns floating around today. We know the importance of this witness when it came to establishing the fact and truth about Jesus because we know the importance of witnesses in the, in the process of establishing any claim of fact. Well, John is here, John is here, John the Baptist is here by divine decree. Like he's the fact checker of Jesus, like he's the one, right? He's the one who was to come and he's pointing people as the witness to the truth of who Jesus was. That was his job, to bear witness, to testify to the reality and the validity of Jesus' ministry. Well, what does he exactly bear witness to? Three truths that John bore witness to. First of all, he bears witness to the impact of the light. The reason John's testimony was so important was because of what he testified regarding the light. The, the, The text says he came as a witness to bear witness about the light Why? That all may believe through him. That's why. Believe what? (laughs) Believe, believe, believe what? Look at John chapter one, 
verse 29, as we look a little further down into to chapter 1 of John's gospel. This is referring to John the Baptist here. The next day, he, John, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, this is what he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You jump down in verse 35. The next day again, John was standing there with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said, Come and you will see. And there they become followers of Jesus. That was John's mission. That was his purpose was to say, that's the one, that's the true light, that's the Lamb of God who came into the world to be the Savior of sinners, follow him. And that's what happens. He preaches the gospel by pointing people to Jesus and people begin following Jesus. So that's the impact that the light has in the world. The light shines in the darkness so that people can believe so that their hearts, which is darkened, can be awakened and, and, and illuminated to the truth of, of their own sin and the truth of who Christ is, so that they may become followers. That's the point of it all. John came to bear witness to Jesus and what he came to accomplish, namely our salvation. Jesus said in John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John 12, verse 46, Jesus again, I have come into the world as a light, or as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. The whole point of the Christmas celebration is that God himself, the Son of God, comes into the world, becomes a man, becomes light in a place of darkness so that we can be rescued from the realm of darkness that we may become believers and followers of this light. And friends, maybe for some in this room, that message is what you need to hear today. Jesus came so that you may not remain in the darkness. And if that is you, if, if, you're, re, if you're in the darkness, it, it's a lonely terrible place to be. And the promise that we have in the scriptures is that God so loved this world, this world that was dark and evil and depraved and rebellious, he so loved this world that he sent his own son into it to illuminate the truth, to be the light, to be salvation, to be hope, so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could be rightly reconciled with God. So trust him, believe in him. Acknowledge your own sin before him and, and cast yourself by faith in his arms. He came to bring people like you out of the darkness. That's what the text says. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's the impact of the light that John bore witness to. Number two, he bore witness to the exclusive nature of the light. Verse nine, the true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Notice John says of Jesus that he is the true light. He, it means he's the genuine light. He's the real thing. He's not one of many. He's not a good one. He's the true one, the real one, the genuine one. Now, we know that there are all kinds of claims have been and will be until Jesus comes again. There are all kinds of claims to light today. But listen, what the Bible teaches us is clear. Any message that does not have the person and work of Jesus Christ as the center of it is not a message of light and hope. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light of the world. And only through him can you be rescued from your darkness, from, from your sin. In church, for us, that means we must be good stewards of this message. We must hold forth the true light as the world's only hope. It's not a buffet of lights. Pick the prettiest one. 
No. There's one light, and it's our job to, in some way, follow John's kind of path. That's the light. He's the one. Trust in him. That's our stewardship, church. That's our responsibility. It's what we're, taught, it's what we're called to, to teach our children. It's what we're called to encourage each other in. It's what we're called to proclaim to this community and to the nations, to the ends of the earth. That there is one and only one true light, and that is Jesus Christ. But then we also see a third thing that John bears witness to, and that is the global reach of the light. John continues, the true light, which gives light to everyone who's coming into the world. True light, which gives light to everyone. He's not saying, just to be clear, he's not saying that everyone in the world will embrace the light and be saved, but he is saying that this light has gone into the whole world as light for all the world. We even know, even from the next few verses, that many refuse the light and remain in darkness. But John's testimony simply reminds us here that the light of Christ is a global light. God's plan of redemption is a global plan for all people. You just hear it time after time after time again in the text. Here in John 1, 9, we see, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. He didn't say just for, for God so loved Jerusalem or Israel. For God so loved the world. Jesus says, I'm the light, not of just this country, but I'm the light of the world. There's a global view, a global view that, that Jesus has when he comes into this world to, to be savior. He came as a light for all people. He's not a light just for some over here. He is the true light for all, for everyone. So, brothers and sisters, that means it must be our mission to hold the light of Christ out for the world to see and hear. That's why several weeks ago we had Missions Sunday, to be reminded that we are called as stewards of God's gospel to get the gospel to the ends of the earth so that the nations can hear. There are people living in darkness today. They have no idea there's a light or they're they're held captive to the wrong, their, their own wrong and, and, and destructive understanding of what they think is light. It's our call, it's our job to make sure that we're getting this light out to the world, that we're sending out people, men and women, to go and tell the world that there is hope and that is found in Christ. That's why we need to give generously to offerings. It's not just something so we can check off and say, oh, we reached a goal. Every dollar you give to an offering like the Lottie Moon Christmas offering means more opportunity to see light go into the darkness. Every shoebox that we just recently filled is opportunity to get light out into the darkness. That's what we're called to do. Not just to hoard light from ourselves and say, oh, isn't that pretty, isn't that great? No, to, to announce it to the world. That's why Jesus came. He came to be savior of sinners for all people so that one day there will be people from all tongues, tribes, nations, and languages gathered before the throne, making much of their glorious savior. He's not just a light for some. He is the true light for all. You know, there's one other thing that's interesting about this light imagery. In fact, it's quite interesting in all this talk about light and Jesus being the light of the world, that in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus says this. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? So that you can get a medal for memorizing 25 Bible verses? No. So that you can be pat on the back and say, hey, you're doing a great job doing this. No. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works 
and give glory to your Father. That's why. Jesus is the light of the world. He came as the one to invade the darkness and bring hope amidst the darkness as the light of the world. And then as we believe in him and become his followers, he turns to us and says, now you, Christian, you, church, are the light of the world. You're the city on a hill, not some nation. No, you, church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light of Christ so transforms his people that he now calls us to be that light to the world. We're called to be lights in a dark and broken world. And the way that we do that here, according to the Sermon on the Mount, is through our good works, through our good deeds, by serving others, by ministering to the poor, by speaking about injustice, by speaking about the the, the hope that we have in Christ, the the hope that we have in, in his gospel, by, by doing good deeds, by, by being a light of, of hope and, and encouragement in the world by many, many ways. And we ultimately do it by pointing others to the true light, the true savior of the world, the one who came to take away the sins of the world. Friends, that's what we're called to do. When you think about Jesus, he transforms us by his light and then he empowers us to be that light to a lost and broken and dying world so that this world can have hope. You know, earlier we sang that third verse of Heart the Herald Angels Sing. Charles Wesley wrote, Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Light and and life. That's what you get when you look to Christ. You get light and you get life. He gives you life, not just for now, but for eternity, and is able to do so because he is the true light that shines in the darkness. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Friends, let's continue to look to Christ because he is the light of the world. We desperately need to look to him, to follow him, and to proclaim him. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the way that you use it to shape us, the way that you use it to inform us, to confront us, to convict us, to challenge us. The way that you use it, Father, to point us to the truths that we need to know and believe, to be reminded of, to be encouraged in, that we may continue to follow you. Lord, we know that we live in a world filled with darkness. And yet the very hope that we have is described as light, the giver of life. And so, Lord, would you help us by your grace to to follow this light, to follow this light we find in Jesus Christ and in him alone. God, you have promised us life, not just physically, but you're the giver of life, spiritually, eternally. Lord, it may be that there are some here today that haven't trusted in Christ and that they don't know what this life is. Father, would you continue to stir their hearts and continue to to show them the truth of Jesus that they may turn from their sins and put their trust and their faith in him, that they would find their sins forgiven, that they would find their lives reconciled to you, a holy and righteous God, that they would find themselves no longer living in darkness but walking in the light. God, do that work. And God, would you remind us that as those who have trusted in you, that we now are called to be light to the world. So Lord, would you help us to be faithful in that through our good works and through our gospel proclamation that we would be stewards of this light that you've called us to walk in, that you would be glorified and that this world would be encouraged and reached and served to follow you. God, that's our prayer and that's our hope. God, use your word to continue to guide us and direct us for your glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's respond to God's word and stand together and praise that joy has dawned through Christ and Christ alone. Joy has dawned upon the world, promise from creation, God's salvation now unfurled, hope for every nation, not with fanfares from above, not with scenes of glory, but a humble gift of love, Jesus born of songs of angels as the mighty prince of life shelters in a stable hands that set each star in place shape the earth in darkness cling now to a mother's breast vulnerable and helpless bow before the Lamb, gazing at the glory, gifts of men from distant lands, prophesy the story, gold the King is born today, incense God is with us, for his death will make a way, by his blood he'll is our message, our hope, light, and life has come in the person and the work of Jesus. Indeed, hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. What a joyful truth for us to remember today as every day that Jesus has come and Jesus forgives and Jesus gives hope and eternal life. John, at, uh, in chapter 3, as we have already read and as we will be dismissed with today, tells us this truth, for God so loved the world, that is, he loved the world in this way, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Are you believing in Jesus and what he's done today on the cross? Then rest assured, based upon the promises of the very words of the Creator, you have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus has come to save. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. What beautiful and encouraging words from the Bible. If you believe in Jesus, you are not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. That is the great need for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without trusting in Christ, you are condemned, still dead in trespasses and sins. 
If that's you here this morning and believing in Jesus is something you're not sure about or something you would like to speak further with, uh, we would love to talk with you more after the service. Grab somebody here that's one of our members. Seek somebody out that we can let you know further in what faith in Christ looks like and believing his promises. We encourage you to do that today. And brothers and sisters, as we leave, let us go with that joy that light and life has come to this world for us. You are dismissed.